So, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the first of the School of Engineering's Elizabeth Georgeson Lectures. Uh, some of you, no doubt, will be wondering who Elizabeth Georgeson is and uh, wh why we are having an Elizabeth Georgeson Lecture. So, I'll briefly introduce her. Elizabeth Helen McLeod Georgeson was born in Glasgow in 1895. But in 1916, at the age of 21, she matriculated as a student at the University of Edinburgh to study engineering. Graduating in July 1919 with a BSc in engineering, achieving a first class certificate of merit in mechanical engineering and becoming our first woman engineering graduate and indeed the first woman to graduate in engineering in Scotland. After graduating, she became an article pupil to a surveyor, hoping to qualify as a civil engineer. But she went on to work at the Safety in Mines Research Laboratory in Sheffield and Buxton, conducting research into the behaviour of gases in mines. She published seven research papers. I think it's interesting to note that the Safety in Mines Research Laboratory eventually became the Health and Safety Laboratory, and to this day it conducts experiments on fires, blast waves and gas explosions. Elizabeth was an early member of the Women's Engineering Society, which was founded in 1919, and in September 1920 she wrote an article on the magic of mathematics for the Society's journal, The Woman Engineer. The sentiments expressed in the article and her advice to engineering students are as relevant today as they were in 1920. So a little over a hundred years later, the School of Engineering established the Elizabeth Georgeson Fellowships in her name. These fellowships are awarded to exceptional early career researchers from groups who are underrepresented in our engineering community. We've asked each fellow to give a public lecture introducing themselves and their research. And we were to have two speakers this evening, but Dr. Desson Kearley uh, has had to be rescheduled due to circumstances beyond their control. So this evening, it's with great pleasure that I introduce to you Dr. Winnie Obande. Winnie earned a BEng in biomedical engineering from the University of Limerick in Ireland and commenced a research career at the Irish Composites Centre in 2012 and subsequently worked towards an MRes in mechanical engineering at the same institution. Her academic pursuit led her to come to the University of Edinburgh where she focused her PhD research on the development of resilient and recyclable polymeric matrices for composite applications employing innovative hybridization methods. And I'm sure I'll learn enough to understand what that means this evening. She's worked with diverse and, and, and impactful collaborations with the academia and industry and has developed invaluable partnerships with key stakeholders. She became a postdoctoral research associate in polymer processing and infusible thermoplastic composites with our research group in the School of Engineering, but earlier this year was awarded one of our prestigious Elizabeth Georgeson Fellowships, and it's for that reason that we've asked her to give a talk this evening. Um, she's, uh, we'd like to welcome some guests, so some mem members of Winnie's family are joining us here and, and online, and there are some friends along as well. So without further ado, I would like you to welcome this evening's speaker, Dr. Winnie Abandi. Good evening, everyone. And thank you so much, David, for such a fantastic introduction. Um, I'd like to start by thanking you all for being here because it's quite a miserable wet day and you've dragged yourself, you've dragged yourself actually um, from work or from different places to come out and watch what I'm actually about to say today. And before we start, if anyone needs connection, please do um, avail of our network today because we'll actually be needing it for later. So the main thing that I'm going to start with is a bit of context. And initially when I was preparing, I thought, surely everyone's going to walk in and think, why is that on the screen when I'm coming to listen to Winnie talk about materials? What do sustainable materials have to do with palm trees and shade trees. And what I wanted to start with is just to give you a bit of context as to what motivates me to drive sustainability within the research I do. 
when I was growing up, I realized that out of all people to motivate me, my grandmothers were the most inspirational as far as sustainability was concerned. They didn't have fancy engineering degrees. They didn't do any of what I do today. But what they did was they valued resources that were available to them. They took those resources and made sure that whatever they were taking from the humble amount that they had did not jeopardize what we had um, as their children and grandchildren subsequently. And I think that really inspired me. So I begin my talk. I should have actually told you what I'm talking about, first of all, so excuse that. I begin my talk today, which is titled, a bit of a mouthful, but the duality of sustainability, exploring durability and recoverability in multifunctional composites. And I will break that down as we go on by raising some valid questions and answering them hopefully for you with the research I've done to date. And we'll also talk about open problems that I can hopefully address as my career evolves. So the materials I work with are called fiber reinforced polymer composites. And again, the names are and terminology, we don't need to worry too much about what each part means, but I think this one's all in the name. So we've got fiber reinforced, we've got reinforcements that are fiber based, and then we've got polymer. So the polymer is what everyone else refers to as plastics pretty much, and it glues the fibers together. It allows us to get the full strength and stiffness that we can get from the fibers. And the new material that we make is a purpose-built material called a composite. So every composite begins its life as, well, every fiber reinforced polymer composite begins its life as a fiber, okay? So we've got various fibers that we can work with, but the ones that I'm particularly interested in um, at the moment are the advanced lightweight fibers that we use, okay? And these tend to be mostly synthetic or natural. I'm showing some synth synthetic ones here. We've got the glass fiber in white, we've got carbon in black, and we've got armid in yellow. And these materials are typically encountered in diverse applications, okay? And I'll be able to show you what these are as we progress. But if I ask for a show of hands right now, don't worry, I wouldn't. But if I ask for a show of hands right now about who has encountered composites before, I might get very sure hands going up. But what I can tell you is most of you have at least encountered one composite or another in your daily living, okay? So these materials are going into different sectors and they're becoming everyday materials um, because of how easy it is to tailor them and because of how lightweight they are. So as I said, we begin with a fiber. We go straight to a fabric. We can have these fabrics being either woven materials or they can be um, what we call non-crimp fabrics. So they tend to sort of be put together in ways that are ordered, okay? Because with composite materials, what we really care about is the alignment of these fibers and we want the continuity of these fibers. We don't want discontinuous fibers. Ideally, we want long continuous fibers. So if we think about um, the key aspects here, fiber going into fabric, and then we take that fabric, cut it up, mold it up into whatever shape we want. We add the glue and the glue is a resin, okay? So it's a polymer resin typically. And once we do that, we can make whatever shapes. Now these are highly complex shapes, but we can make flat shapes, we can make curved shapes. It all depends on your application. So these are basically purpose-built materials is what I'm describing them as, because you design them with your end application in mind. It's very different to taking a block of steel or a lump of aluminium and saying, I want to tailor this for whatever. In this case, you're thinking about it from the ground up. You're thinking about the fibers and how they interact with the matrix and how that all works together to get you the purpose um, or to get you the properties that you want for your purpose, okay? So this chart, some of us here are engineers, so we've seen something like this before. And for some of us, this might be a bit strange, but this is a material selection chart. It's an Ashby plot. It allows us to quickly digest the relative differences between materials typically, okay? So what we're able to see here is we're able to see composites in purple. Um, not able to show you exactly on the video, but I guess the purple here that you can see is composite materials and you can see polymers here. So what I'm showing is density on the x-axis and strength on the y-axis. So the higher it is, 
the stronger it is. The lower it is, the weaker it is. And on this side of things, we've got the lightweight materials and we've got heavy materials here. So metals, understandably, are here. What is important to see is that by adding fibers into composites, we're still sitting roughly about the same density as polymers. So this is quite important for us, okay? And also then we are able to attain strengths that we couldn't otherwise attain with polymers, but actually almost on par with some metals. So it's very important um, that we actually understand the composites are very tailorable. And this has allowed us to see them enter into different sectors. They pretty much started off as prime materials for aviation, okay? We've seen them in lots of planes. So that's why I said most of us here would have seen or experienced composites in one form or another. They started off mostly in aviation where they were used for light weighting. And light weighting is a philosophy that basically means that we are replacing materials that are higher or heavier, in essence, higher in density with lighter weight materials that are still able to perform the strength um, and stiffness or perform well in terms of strength and stiffness. We've seen them also enter into automotive, rail, and also the renewable energy sectors as well. Okay, so these are very important materials for us. All that being said, we have a lot to still explore. Okay, there are loads of materials that we can use, but currently a lot of the advanced composite um, applications tend to rely on carbon, glass, and aramid. And these are, you can kind of pick and choose whichever you need based on cost or density and their actual performance. For example, if you're looking for something cheap and cheerful, and I'm saying cheap and cheerful relative to the others, not that it's actually cheap and cheerful, you might go for glass. But if you go for glass, you're basically at a higher density than you would get with carbon. So if you've got the money and you're trying to go for something lightweight, maybe carbon might be for you. Then Aramid is fantastic for ballistic, ballistics applications. So a lot of you might have seen in um, sort of movies and different um, areas where bulletproof vests are used, that typically requires Kevlar, which is Aramid in essence, okay? So down to the main meat of the, the day. We've talked about how composites are important. The next thing we need to talk about is how we need to do better as far as improving their durability and their actual recoverability and why that is important. So the numbers I wanna to present to you today are projected values initially, and then I'll talk about our current performance. By 2024, it is estimated that we will need 175 kilotons per year of car uh, carbon fibers, okay? These are virgin carbon fibers straight out of the factory, straight being manufactured, okay? And I'm using these bobbins here just to sort of represent them so that you can quickly see as they scale up. By 2025, that number increases. And not just by a little, it increases significantly. The trends here are that we are gonna keep needing carbon fibers because more and more sectors are relying on lighter weight materials. It's becoming more important for us to consider um, composites as, I guess, the ideal candidate materials for transportation for aviation, and even now for construction. It's becoming more important. So as we continue to rely on new um, carbon fiber production, we have to start thinking that these materials are not infinitely available. They're finite resources. So if we're getting more and more materials, it means there is more raw material extraction, there is more energy being inputted, input into it, and there's also more emissions associated with the whole process. So this is something that we need to consider. Can every process, can every application, can every sector always need virgin materials? Perhaps not. Now, our current capacity, we are at 125 kilotons per year. And th these values are, they're just numbers, right? But if you think about it as we're not meeting the need in the future. That's all I wanna drive home right now. The numbers are important, but we're not able to meet the need for the future at our current rates. So, bit of fun for us right now. I'm gonna get everyone to get interactive and I want you all to have a bit of a guess as to how much we're actually depositing, or not depositing, sorry, how much we're actually um, disposing of right now as far as our composite uh, carbon fiber production, okay? So we're gonna use something called WooClap um, as our interactive app tonight. And I will just switch over to that right now. It requires a phone or 
some sort of electronic device. I hope that's okay with everyone. Okay, so to join WooClap, you can just scan the QR code or you can go on WooClap and type in the code. Some of us might be familiar with it. If you're not, please look to your side and ask someone to help you. And I'm going to preface this by saying there are no wrong answers tonight because it's all anonymous. So don't worry about that. Is this a argument? Yes, I'm going to get that going. Apologies. Uh, is that working for everyone now? I see numbers going in, so I suppose it is. Excellent. OK. Just give it one more minute, and we'll see if we can get a few more thoughts in there. Remember, there is no right or wrong answer. Well, there is a right answer, but <laughs> even if you put a wrong answer in there, no one will know. <laughs> OK, so we'll take a bit of a pause on that. Oh, more people committing. Excellent. OK, I think w we've got a bit of a, yeah, we've got a clear winner. So most people think it is between 30 and 40 kilotons per year. Will I show you what it is? So that's the amount. <laughs> I can tell immediately who's gotten it right by the faces and by the expressions. Fantastic. OK. And this number might seem small, but it is a significant chunk of our production capacity, right? If we're only able to produce 125 kilotons per year, why are we getting rid of 40, nearly 40 kilotons per year? Can we not do something about that? Can, can there not be some sort of recovery process that helps us to use up these materials for maybe not so advanced applications? Um, and as I mentioned, these are landfill bound waste so you can see a little insert there or inset there of um, actual comp components being landfilled so this is a huge problem at the moment it's a devastating issue and there's not enough being done about it so let's try and understand more the implications of always relying on new material extraction always relying on new material production okay we've got as I say, I think it's 125 kiloton per year capacity currently. We will need 175 kiloton per year by 20, uh, 2024. And just to make that number realistic and sort of sit in a bit clearer, that's enough energy. Basically, the amount of energy we'll need is enough energy to power a standard, an average three bed house in Scotland, specifically here in Edinburgh, for six and a half years just to produce carbon for one year. Um, so for me, I think there should be better ways. And a lot of my colleagues agree, and we are working actively in this way, but I think it's, it's going to need a bit more of a shift in industry for people to start accepting recycled materials and reclaimed materials. So just one more quick WooClap session, and that will take us through to the next session, OK? So we are here. OK, apologies. Right. Our second question. I've told you that it takes about six and a half years worth of energy, right, for powering a house to make the amount of carbon fibers we need. How many more years or how many years worth of energy would it be, um, would it require 
if we took that carbon fiber and we recycled it. Any more brave guesses? Okay, I think it's time for the reveal. Less than a year. Less than a year. Literally less than a year is how much it will cost us to recycle what we've been disposing so far. So I think there is a need to do better. And just so we see why that's quite important, I remind us of that figure from earlier. And now we can talk more about the whole duality that I was talking about earlier. Why has it been challenging? Because surely if it's a pressing issue, there have been challenges limiting us from being able to attain this, okay? So durability and recoverability. Bit of a heavy slide <laughs> since we've been sort of mostly dealing with um, images, but it's, it's important to get to understand why durability is important and what determines durability, okay? So durability from a composites standpoint is pretty much determined and governed by how the material is, um, what, what conditions it's exposed to in its lifetime, how it's loaded over its lifetime. Does it get exposed to UV aging, for example? Um, is it exposed to varying uh, temperatures, so the thermal aging aspect? And does it, is it susceptible to, to fires, for example? We also know that pH plays a role, salinity plays a role. So we need to explore these options, okay? And typically, from a mechanical standpoint, we have a good understanding because there's been years of research to back it up. We've got a good enough understanding of how our design of the composite plays a role as far as the mechanical performance and the mechanical durability. Because you can vary, I talked about the fibers earlier, but you can vary the alignment, you can vary um, the orientation of each layer relative to the other, you can vary the selection of materials. So all these things are there for us to consider. And when we don't take these things into consideration, what happens is we have progressive failure or progressive um, damage mechanisms that then ultimately leads to failure that can be catastrophic. And this could be pretty much things that are failing maybe at a fraction of their pr uh, projected lifetime, which is quite an important consideration for us. So in terms of recoverability, excuse the poor quality image on that, <laughs> but in terms of recoverability, what drives recoverability? Ultimately, it's the reshapability of the material. Can the material be reshaped afterwards, okay? And what happens currently, the state of the art, is if it's a material that can be reshaped, it tends to be sort of ground up. It gets heated up and molded, in essence, into a new, prop into a new um, structure, okay? And when I say ground up, I'm sure <laughs> um, the keen members of the audience would kind of quickly think, well, you said we couldn't really cut down the fibers earlier. So why are we cutting fibers down now? And that is the issue, right? We are cutting down fibers. We're cutting down valuable fibers that are long to short fibers. And we're randomizing them. They're no longer ordered and sort of in the direction of loading anymore. The other methods that we have to deal with are really kind of, um, they're energy intensive is what I will say. We can heat up the samples. We can heat up the components, sorry, um, under inert conditions. And we can typically do this from maybe about 350 to 700 degrees. And we tend to be able to get the fibers back out. But again, randomized fibers. The fibers lose much of their strength and their value because we've cut them up, we've randomized them. It's really not great. So there really needs to be some uh, improvements in this area. So this brings me to, I've talked about reformability what is reformability and what determines it? So we talked about the fibers extensively. The other component 
the resin system, we can choose between thermosets and thermoplastics. And thermosets, for <laughs> want of a better analogy, we can think of them as being almost like super glue in terms of joining things together. And super glue is, is a thermoset. And we can think of a thermoplastic as being more like a hot melt glue gun. Okay? So if you visualize them, you can already see that one is very sort of low viscosity, what I'm going to explain later as well, low viscosity liquid, the other is very thick and it tends to be harder to push into surfaces. So that's something that's quite important for us. The other consideration is once these materials are hardened, how easily can they be reshaped? Okay. So on the thermoset side, I can tell you not so easily. On the thermoplastic side, it can be reshaped almost repeatedly, but there is a limit because a the thermoplastic remembers. It's got memory. It's got thermal memory specifically. And we want to always understand the limit to the recyclability of these thermoplastics. Okay. Another thing that's quite important is if it can be reheated, surely that also means that it's got good, as in for thermosets specifically, it's got good resistance to heat. So that's quite a good thing as far as your ability is concerned. So there are some sort of positive and negative um, attributes for each of these materials that we've got to consider. I also mentioned here that you know thermoplastics are tough and thermosets are brittle because that's quite important. Composites are inherently brittle. So when we can get a bit more ductility or toughness in there, we want that. We want that all the way. So anywhere that we can sort of make changes, ideally we should. So we've got good impact resistance, we've got good fracture toughness. In terms of corrosion resistance, it's about neck and neck for both. But thermosets tend to be winners in this area as well. So I talked about impact resistance earlier. It is important because we can see a lot sort of of damage happen in a part. OK, and I'll just do that one more time. We can see a part that is in service and impact can happen as far as for aviation. I think the biggest sources of impact would be tool drop during maintenance operations. Um, you also have issues with bird strike. And that is literally what it sounds like. It's a bird striking critical structures. Um, you've got hailstones as well. So these things need to be understood better. Okay? When we have such damage, it renders the part sort of not great for the application that it's currently in, but can we take it and use it for something else perhaps? So these, these are important considerations. I mentioned viscosity earlier cheekily without explaining it. And viscosity is, I guess the easiest way of explaining it is when you see the difference between water and honey, for example, as far as flow is concerned, then that's basically what the difference between thermosets and thermoplastics would be. Okay? One of them flows better, the other one doesn't flow as easily. Thermoplastics tend to need a bit of encouragement, and we do that encouragement by applying heat and pressure. And that just means it is slightly more energy intensive. Okay? So we want to typically avoid anything that requires um, applying more energy. Thermosets, a lot of them can be processed at room temperature or at least low temperatures, which is fantastic. There are actually new materials that allow us to be able to process thermoplastics almost in exactly the same way as thermosets. And I spent quite a bit of time during my PhD exploring some of these and seeing if they had any drawbacks relative to their um, thermoset counterparts. And the other thing that we have to see is industry wasn't as ready to sort of take these materials up because there were new materials. Anytime you've got new materials, you've got some <laughs> apprehension about uptake. So the question that everyone had was, okay, we've got alternative resins, but you know, does it actually make any difference as far as manufacturing? So we did some testing in-house. We had a almost a 500 by 500 mil um, plate to manufacture. And we basically loaded this cavity here with dry fibers. And we're looking at glass fibers here, okay? And we decided to inject or infuse what we call infused resin into the system. The resin is liquid. It was all done at room temperature. And this was done under vacuum. We found that it took only five and a half minutes to infuse the reactive thermoplastic system, this new thermoplastic system I was talking about that's liquid at room temperature. In contrast, 
the state of the art takes about 27 minutes roughly to infuse the full thing. So the difference is clear here, really. The new material performs better. Then, of course, you had people asking questions. How does it compare mechanically? Again, we took it upon ourselves. We went and we explored. We looked at mechanical performance. And this is a bit too detailed to be going into today, but I just wanted to show it so you could see some of the modes that we tested. We tested the samples in tension, i.e. pulling them. We tested some of them I didn't show here in compression, i.e. just crushing them. Um, we tested some of them in flexure, bending them. And we tested some of them as well in shear, where the fibers or the, the layers are encouraged to slide past each other. Okay, and we studied how these would work. Another important thing is sort of, um, I'm going to be able to show that here, hopefully. Uh, there we go. We were able to do something called um, interlaminar fracture toughness tests. And hopefully you should be able to see what I'm showing you here. But basically, it, how we test that is we try to pull apart the laminate. Okay, and we can see things like cohesive and adhesive failure, which means is it failing in the, uh, the glue line or is it failing outside of the glue line in essence, okay? Now, there are ways of improving the interfra interlaminar fracture toughness and I'm using a staple stapler here to show you that you can actually improve the through thickness performance. So just humor me for a little bit as I staple my way through this. And what we basically could see, because I've done some work with 3D woven materials and in essence, what they do is they put a binder material through, okay? So our staples are binders here. You get to that, it arrests the crack, okay? And this is also important for things like impact performance because if you look at impact, the layers are trying to pull apart. So these are very important considerations. Now, what we found, forgetting about the fact that this is a massive chart, it's a lot of data to take in, but ideally what I wanted to show you is that the reactive thermoplastic composite is virtually comparable across the board. In fact, it performs better in some cases, okay? Oh, and another thing, it still retains its thermoplasticity once it's, well, I should probably explain that. Um, it still retains its reshapeability once we've formed it into a composite. The other beautiful thing that we saw was that rather than being brittle, like the traditional thermoset material, it tried to pull apart in a more ductile way. So this was a, a promising find for us. And oh, we've published this as well. So if anyone's interested, you could check that out or talk to me about it later. And I'll be able to give you more information. Um, the questions that came up next were, is this ma new material durable? because thermoplastics have sort of issues of, as far as durability from a solvent resistance perspective. So we took that and put it to the test. We took a sample of the new material once it was cured or hardened, and we stuck it in acetone as a simple solvent to begin with, okay? We checked it every so often, starting with five minutes, we saw it hadn't really changed that much. Hopefully that's quite visible from the back. 60 minutes, okay, that's dissolving. 120 minutes, still there, it's pretty much nearly dissolved. By 210 minutes, everything was gone. Now this might seem irrelevant, but imagine a composite material. Again, these are materials that are used in planes and trains, all across, you know, different things. Imagine pouring some cleaning solvents accidentally on these components. Right, so these are quite important tests to, to sort of understand their significance as well. Um, the next thing then we thought was, can we improve the solvent resistance? We were quite brave. We thought, right, this material is new. People don't really trust it. We've already shown that it's quite comparable. Now we've seen a weakness. Can we improve that weakness? We took it and we added a lot of things to it. <laughs> now I'm showing you the sort of better end of it when we've already figured it out. But at the start, it took a while because we wanted to maintain its low viscosity. We wanted to keep it nice and easy to use and to manufacture. And we wanted to make sure that it stayed recyclable. So we considered different criteria really. We looked at 
Is it really separating after some time? Is it separating after 24 hours, just sitting by itself? So basically the two phases that we mix together, are they trying to separate? Are they missable? Um, the next thing we looked at was when we consolidate this material and make it into a solid, is it having sort of good, uh, what's the word I'll use? Homogeneity, like does it look like one material or is it looking like two separate materials? So that was quite important for us. And then the surface finish was really important because if we can't get uniform surface finish, that translates right through to the interface between the fibers and the glue, the resin, okay? So these are some of our successful trials as far as manufacturing them. We basically could see that our limit as far as miscibility was adding five weight percent of our additive. Okay, there's a lot of data to digest, but we're not gonna bother looking too much into detail. Five weight percent of our additive was what was a magic number. We did extended testing as far as solvent resistance to see if this made any difference. And I can happily report right now that it did. So remember our unmodified material that we talked about earlier that dissolved pretty much after 210 minutes. We basically decided, right, we're going to do 60 minute short term ones and 72 hour long term testing, okay? Unmodified, pretty much fully disintegrated or dissolved after 72 hours. Modified, we see that there is no change after 5 weight percent. Just the fact that we've added this, um, this additive was good enough, okay? So this was quite promising. Then the next thing we wanted to understand was, does this work in a composite case? Because all I've shown you so far is just polymers. Does it work when we throw in fibers in there or do things act differently? Good answer, it does, okay? Really promising results. We were able to show that rather than disintegrating into just fibers like so, we get nice solid units, okay? And of course, some of you are thinking, how does this affect recoverability? And we talked about recoverability earlier as ideally the materials reformable. So we put it through the test again. We decided to heat up the samples to 180 degrees, held for about 15 minutes, then took them out, deformed them right away and let them cool. We use a thermoset as a standard just to see is this actually a, a valid test at all. The thermoset did not deform, right? Unmodified, yeah, we get some deformation and then everything else deforms. Everything else deforms. So everything still stays reshapeable, which is fantastic, okay? But of course, oh, before I go on, if anyone wants to talk to me about the results, please do, all published. Um, can we then sort of understand the importance of reshapability um, for recoverability. What we decided to do was we explored in another study the effects of flattening a curved laminate, okay? And you might ask, why is that important? Well, we're having larger and larger components coming out of, say, wind energy, for example, or tidal. And when they come to the end of their life, typically 20, 25 years, what happens to them? Are they going to be landfilled or are they going to be reused in some way or another? So we then decided to flatten these out. After flattening them out, we tested them and we found that they hadn't actually lost that much of their uh, performance. They retained a good amount of their performance. And in addition, rather than heating up to 350, 700 degrees, we only heated these up to 120 degrees. So ultra low temperature compared to what's normally required for recycling. Other major news is, or other major benefit, is we were able to retain our length. We didn't have to cut anything down, which means hopefully in future, we should be able to see parts being decommissioned and then used as is or flattened and hopefully used for other applications. And again, chat to me after just to see if you're interested in these results as well. So this offers improved um, reuse potential is what we're calling it for diverse sectors, the sectors I mentioned earlier. The larger and larger parts get, the more we have to figure out new ways of extracting the values. Because as I said, the value is not just a uh, 
we've got this weight of material in it. We've got to start considering the carbon footprint or the emissions side of things, and we've got to consider the actual raw material extraction side of things as well, and energy. So I've talked a lot about these new materials that we tested and what we did with them and what we found and the fantastic things that we um, were able to discern. But what next? What, what other open problems remain to be addressed as far as durability and recoverability? And I think the main thing that I can say is now we already know that, yes, there are loads of um, recycled parts that have been shortened and that will continue to be shortened because it will take a while for industry to accept new methods. But what do we do with those shortened fibers? Can we take them and improve their alignment in any way? Can we make high value processing materials with them that can then be used with good reliability as far as in secondary applications, potentially even way more applications down the line? Can we actually take that and extend things? So there are also, you know, you can imagine if you're heating up um, fibers to about 700 degrees, you will compromise the, the coatings that are put on the fibers to make them interface better and make them more compatible with the resin. So can we develop new systems to actually start addressing the changes that happen to the fibers during recycling? The second aspect that I'm potentially, um, that I'm particularly interested in is natural fibers. We, we've been stuck on synthetic fibers so far because they offer better properties, but can we improve the properties of natural fibers for, I guess, intermediate performance? Can we improve them for hybridization with um, synthetic fibers? That's already being done, but can we do better in them such that we start offsetting the virgin material requirements into the future. Then the third aspect that I am very excited about and I'm currently exploring um, involves the use of these recycled materials in a field or a sector that particularly needs it right now. And it's almost sort of a, a way of demonstrating that recycled materials and natural materials can be used in place of virgin materials for a high performance application, particularly looking at something called a proton exchange membrane fuel cell. Um, these are going to be particularly useful in um, fuel cell vehicles into the future, electric vehicles. And I'm very interested in this because currently bipolar plates, which are one of the key uh, multifunctional uh, elements of PEM fuel cells, they're basically accounting for about 80% of the weight and cost of the fuel cell stack. So we can do better with composite materials. If you remember the little chart I showed earlier, you can easily replace metals with composites and get greater benefits as far as light weighting is concerned. So I think this is an area that I really want to see change in and I'm putting my weight behind it as far as um, research is concerned. The main thing I should highlight is that the reason I've called them multifunctional components is that they need to be resilient to a lot of different conditions. High temperature, high corrosion, or high corrosion resistance ideally would be great. They will also see dynamic electrochemical changes within the, the um, fuel cell stack, and they have a lot of mechanical loading um, issues as well that we need to try factor into the design of them. So that is all for now. Um, I'd like to end by sort of acknowledging that the work that I've presented has been a collaborative effort between colleagues here at the university and beyond. I've listed some here. It's not an exhaustive list, but I'd like to thank you all for listening as well. And I welcome any questions from you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for an exceptionally interesting and thought-provoking uh, presentation. Thank you. And uh, we'll see if we have any questions. Excellent. Cool. And can I ask you to repeat the questions that you're asked Absolutely. so that the audience online can hear Absolutely. them? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Camilla. Um, I have lots of questions, but I'll ask one. Um, you. It looks as though you're, that composite material, the, the idea is it can be 
reshaped so mm. it stays the same material. What would um, the implications be like? I mean, obviously, I think of wind turbine blades, but you've also got, I presume, the front of the train. Similarly, they get degraded by abrasive hitting them. Um, how would that be? Are there ways that could be dealt with? I guess? Yeah. That's a very good question. So you're asking for a material that's seen a full extent of its life, that's experienced everything as far as degradation potentially could, yeah. How do you take that material and reuse it with surety that it's going to perform well, right? Excellent. So this is part of what I'm trying to actually do now of sort of factoring in different elements of the, um, the material's life and whatever it's being subjected to as far as processing, recycling. Um, so getting a sort of full field study of it first to understand how much we need to make changes as far as surface functionality, as far as are we getting way more variability from one particular stream? So are composites coming from, say, wind energy having way more variability than things from tidal? Are things coming from uh, the automotive sector potentially better? And then I think that will start giving more confidence to um, sort of help the uptake of these materials down the line. So I think it's part of the process. It is, it's not something that will be done in a year or two. I think it's going to take collaborative effort. Um, a lot of cross-disciplinary research as well will have to go into this because they'd have to be interfacial characterization. Um, I didn't mention there, but some sort of advanced oxidation process could be used as greener uh, surface functionalization or surface tailoring methods. So there are, there's a lot that could be done in this way, I think. Yeah, excellent question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, other questions? Fresh. Uh, very nice talk, Vinny. Thank um, you. So you did allude to this uh, the aspect of processing. Um, and processing is highly energy intensive, especially for polymers or uh, the manufacturing. Do you have any? Uh, and processing is happening usually in chemical plants mm -hmm. to, to produce this. Do you have any suggestions on what you want to see in terms of the change so that you have polymers which are sustainable right from the processing? Absolutely. Thank you for that question. Um, so if I understand correctly, you're asking the current processes that we use to manufacture both fibers and, say, the polymers, um, do I have any ideas to make them more sustainable into the future? And without giving too much away, there is a project that we've been working on um, to help sort of offset the reliance on virgin uh, production from fossil um, based resources using more renewable resources to manufacture some of these fibers. So that's an, an area that we could potentially explore. Um, there are also um, ongoing efforts to try and come up with bio-based resins. Um, it's still all in its infancy at the moment, so I can't say with certainty that that will you know, see us getting uh, rid of all the process that we're using already. I think it's going to have to be a sort of a, a slow, slow start, and then we hopefully will gain more traction as we go, and hopefully people will trust the materials more into the future. Yeah. Thank you. So the magic additive you talked about that created this whole difference in the durability and we see here with solvent resistance, was there a framework you used to arrive at that particular additive? Yes, okay, so I'll, I'll repeat the question. It's a good question. Um, I probably should have made that clearer as well because I hinted at the fact that we struggled. But the question is the the additive that we used for tailoring the solvent resistance of the acrylic matrix. How did we arrive at that additive as being the ideal additive? OK, great question. So what we did was we started looking at the sol uh, solubility parameters. And this, this is a lot more <laughs> applied that I wanted to go into tonight. But we started looking at the solubility parameter of different polymers um, and the interaction with our base material. Um, and ultimately, what we did was we selected a few, we down-selected a few of them, and we thought, okay, right, now that we've down-selected them, how do they compare as far as interaction, right? Everything we thought was all theoretical, but we took the, for example, the materials we started off with were initially on paper gray additives. We mixed them in and we found out very quickly we couldn't 
infuse them at room temperature anymore. Okay, so that was a huge red flag for us. Um, the second material that we tried out, even though it potentially could be cured or hardened at room temperature, it wasn't flowing at all. It was as thick as maybe treacle, so we just couldn't do anything with it. So we started thinking about, right, what, is the great, what are the great advantages of the base resin that we want to maintain? We decided those, and then we just kept working systematically towards arriving at the final material. I hope that answer is a bit clearly. I've gone a bit back and forth, but yeah. Okay. So you're asking, what is the current uh, landscape with industry as far as the relationship with industry? Are they willing to take up these technologies that we're developing? And I'm also going to maybe add an extra layer to that of, are they informing the decisions we're making as far as the decisions that have to be made into the future? Um, so the first thing we try to do typically with these projects is try and sort of establish where industry is at currently. I'll give you an example with the PEM fuel cell one, for example. Talks with industry had to happen first. And the questions I had for them were more around, you're currently using metallic fuel cells, metallic bipolar plates, metallic components. What challenges have you encountered? And I worked backwards from that whilst also reading um, what other researchers have found about metallic fuel cells and fuel cell components specifically. And I think then eventually having talks with them, I was able to then convince them that actually potentially replacing some of your components with composites would be the right way to go. So that's the one for the fuel cells on. The one for fiber waste is a bit trickier because it depends on what the industry partner or stakeholder you're talking to is looking for. If they've already got established processes that took them years to get into, for example, aviation, the regulatory processes are, you don't want to go <laughs> poking at that, right? But there are potential um, starting points that you could have with different industries. You could start off with easier to, to what I'll call easier to abate <laughs> um, sectors at the moment, start working implement or incrementally. And once they get confidence, they'll hopefully do the marketing for you as far as this material is great. Yeah, I hope that answer as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I'll repeat that for those online. So you're asking if the alignment makes a difference to the performance and also how did we assess them, uniaxially or biaxially? Okay, excellent question. So yes to the first one. Um, the alignment makes a huge difference. So we, I'll try to go back to uh, one of our slides here. It might take a while, bear with me, there we go. So we were very interested in studying the effects of alignment and orientation, okay? And there are two things. When you're talking about alignment, sometimes it's more about are there any deviations from sort of uh, a principal axis, right? So maybe plus or minus zero, or sorry, plus or minus three, plus or minus five degrees. Um, that type of alignment we didn't look into intricately, but in terms of the orientation of the fibers, is it prim uh, primarily in the zero, primarily in the 90? Yes, we were very interested in that. When it comes to looking at things like impact performance, ideally we wanted to look at sort of more a uh, zero 90 orientation where fibers are going this way and that way, and the reason for that is in impact um, characterization, you are gonna get the worst case as far as damage is concerned where fibers are differently oriented. If they're about the same, they try to bend the same, so they're not gonna delaminate crazily, which means separate, okay? If they're like this, this fiber is trying to bend a certain way, this fiber is trying to bend a certain way, they don't like it. Then they start pulling apart. So we explored those for sure, yeah. Thank you very much. I think we uh, I think had a question. Oh, one last question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, one of my questions is in terms of this new polymer that you've synthesized and the way it works, have you looked at the aging effects of it and how it will perform over the years? So, is it situ? Is, there, is that a, um, a concern or do you think it will work just as well as it does a normal composite we have now today? Great question. So just to repeat for those online, you're asking um, the, the hybrid polymer that we came up with, how does it age? And over the years, is that gonna perform any differently to how it currently is performing? So 
I mentioned earlier that there were collaborators, and specifically um, my PhD supervisor is here, Dr. Deepa Roy in front. I know she doesn't want any attention, but um, there are people in her research team right now doing the work on taking this a step further as far as seawater aging. And we've been seeing actually that there are areas that we could improve the um, aging performance in, into the future, but in terms of the preliminary studies, we are finding that the first few years of accelerated aging, it is performing quite well. But maybe into the future, there are avenues that we could possibly tailor it as well. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So I, I, think, I think we need to uh, draw the formal festivities to an end at, at this point. I'd like to thank you all for some very interesting questions. I'd particularly like to thank Willie for an amazing and very entertaining and very interesting and thought-provoking presentation. So can I ask you all to put your hands together and thank our speaker. <laughs>